Welcome to Keep the Game Beautiful podcast. Each week, I highlight incredible people who are doing amazing things in soccer, the beautiful game. I'm Anna Turi, your host. Thank you for listening. Today, I'm releasing another episode from United Soccer Coaches Convention in Kansas City. Today, I talk with Mandy Green. Mandy is a coach with a crazy busy life. She actually started a business because of this. Her business is called Busy Coach. She helps to manage coaches' lives and just their time in general. This was really interesting to learn about. We learn about why she started it and what it is in general and also what coaches can really get out of it. I know that's something I struggle with, time management and just being so busy, but something like this could definitely be very helpful to help manage life and just stay organized. We also talk about her coaching career. One of my favorites was talking about her time at South Dakota. She had to rebuild the program at South Dakota, and there were challenges that came with it, but the program definitely came out better in the end. I hope you enjoy the episode. Today, joining me from United Soccer Coaches Convention in Kansas City is Mandy Green. Mandy has coached at numerous different level, different collegiate teams over the past 18 years. She worked to completely rebuild the program at South Dakota. Currently, Mandy is an assistant coach at Youngstown University. She started Busy Coach and works to help other coaches find balance in their lives. Mandy, would you like to add anything else, or what got you to where you are today? Yeah, man, I, uh, you know what I want to say, honestly, I think I've been coaching about 23 years now. I've got the gray hairs to prove it. Um, yeah, I've coached uh, University of Utah, I was at Xavier, I was at LMU, South Dakota, uh, and my husband and I moved to Youngstown State. I, uh, I just volunteer there now, but uh, have my company Busy Coach, like you said. And then I also do a lot to help college coaches recruit student athletes. Uh, so I work with a company called Tutor Collegiate Strategies, and I get to travel all over the place and, and talk with coaches every day on communicating with uh, with high school student athletes that they're trying to recruit. So. I always ask three questions before we get into the podcast. First, what does the beautiful game mean to you? Gosh, you know what? Soccer has been something that I have, uh, I mean, I've been doing since I was a little kid. And I would, the friendships that, I mean, it means to me, like, when I think soccer, I think friendships. I mean, I've gotten to know so many people through soccer, and I've gotten to travel to so many different places through soccer. So it uh, it certainly has uh, done a lot for me. And I know I've been able to, I feel like at least hopefully positively influence quite a lot through teaching the game. So... Yeah, I would say. What are actions or things you do to keep the game beautiful? Actions to keep the game beautiful. That is a great question. I think, um, I mean, things like this, right? Education opportunities for coaches to get together and share a bunch of ideas for things that they're doing that are working and not working. So we all have a resource and people to go to, 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 you know, learn faster and apply quicker things that are, you know, helping to make more impact with, uh, with young kids and, uh, make the game fun for them. How do you encourage others to keep the game beautiful? How do, uh, I think uh, the attitude they bring to it, right, is because uh, there are some, right, who uh, they're they're bringing to the game nothing but negativity, and so trying to encourage the positive attitude and the right, uh, making the right choices with uh, how they're approaching the game, how they're approaching their coaches with the game, how they're approaching their parents, right, with a game, and then uh, I mean, obviously the referees with a game, all of that, they have a choice on how they respond to it. So uh, I try to encourage that a lot. I want to start off and ask you a little bit about rebuilding the South Dakota program. Mm-hmm. What was that like? Well, that was, I mean, it was hard on many levels. And one, the biggest thing is I became a uh, first-time mom and a first-time head coach all within about 10 days of each other. And uh, where the, uh, at South Dakota, soccer wasn't uh, very high on the totem pole, right? They were really trying to build up basketball and football. And so 
I mean, we uh, we you know did did what we could with the resources that we had, and so it it took longer than we had hoped, but it was uh, you know a lot of it was uh, no matter what we had to deal with. Uh, bottom line, it came down to our vision and the impact that we felt like we could have with the student athletes. That is what we sold uh, to to the kids, the experience we could provide, and. Uh, the, the vision for the role they were going to have on the team, but also the graduating with the degree from, from the school, what it was going to mean to them and what was going to set them up for afterwards. So we, um, we, uh, that, that was a big focus in our communication with all the kids that we were, we were trying to bring on into the program. I had read that you did have to do a decent amount of recruiting to mm -hmm. rebuild this in general. Mm -hmm. What did you look for when finding a perfect player? You know, at first, uh, I think it evolved actually over my few years there. We uh, at, at first we were trying to find anybody that was looking to play because they got there late, and with uh, Division One recruiting, right? It, usually they're two years ahead, and so when I got there, we were already late. So we had to go out and get a bunch of kids really quick. And so at first it was like, you are quality enough to be a Division One athlete. Okay, awesome, we'll take you. Uh, and then especially as the years went on, we uh, we really had to make sure that we were finding kids that were had the personality characteristics that we were looking for. Because there are a lot of kids out there that have talent, but if they were not nice, right? If they weren't bought into what we were doing, if they didn't have the work ethic we were after, or were more interested in extracurricular activities than being there to help and support the team, we're very selfish, right? We, uh, we, as we went on, we really tried to do a better job of asking good questions to make sure that we were finding the kids that were a good fit. So it was a lot of recruiting. My son had been to 23 states by the time he was two because we had to get out and we 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 were on the road quite a bit so but it, it was uh, lots of recruiting but lots of asking good questions and having good conversations I know many high schoolers my age don't really realize how important character is during the recruiting process mm -hmm. how can we help the athletes realize that uh, how can you help the athletes realize it I mean I mean certainly through you know podcasts like this and continuing to educate coaches that are uh, continuing to interview coaches that are looking for character type things but I mean, I, I just, I know so many coaches that will, they stop, stop recruiting kids as soon as they see, you know, the, the bad body language, the, how they treat their parents, right? When they come off the field, educating kids on, on those types of things is, you know, games done and they're throwing their stuff at their parents and they're yelling at their parents or they're yelling at the refs during the game. It's like... Eh, you know, I mean, coaches are always paying attention. And so I, I think it's just educating, right? Educating the clubs, right? And so hopefully that information will filter down into the kids. But coaches do pay attention to all that kind of stuff. Some, some more than others, right? But I think ultimately when you're in college, you only have four years. And coaches, right, we have a choice. We have a choice as to who we select. And it makes more sense to find people that are enjoyable to be around than, than those that aren't going to be bought in or that have bad behavior. So doing a little extra research up front is certainly helpful. What advice would you give an athlete wanting to stand out to a college coach? I would say don't focus on... I, I would say you got to find... Find the one or two things that are your thing that make you good, right? Is if I'm looking for a, a center back, right? I want a physical, you know, I mean, there are certain things that I want. Uh, and so if you're amazing in the air, like focus on that in the game. Like every ball that comes through the air, you're winning that, right? Or if you're amazing with a ball at your feet, you got to find ways to get the balls at your feet, right? And, and showcase those things. Because I think, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of really good, well-rounded players, but a lot of times coaches, when they're sitting on the sidelines, they're looking for a few key specific uh, attributes of a student athlete that will stand out and are better than everybody else. And so certainly need to be well-rounded, but really uh, specialize in a, in a few things here, there, and that will stand out and that will help. You talked about traveling all over. How did you manage to find time for yourself? Uh, I, at first, I didn't do a very good job of that, but, but that's where my company, Busy Coach, a lot of that came from me trying to solve my own problems, right, that I had created for myself. Uh, but a lot of it was just getting clear, clear on the, yes, I want to coach, but what is the lifestyle that I need to have to be a happy coach? 
you know, because realizing that as a happy coach, that not only affects me, but it affects my family and it affects the teams that I'm coaching, right? And so once I, uh, I got a, uh, a, a few hard reality checks as to, mm, I, I am not acting in a way or living in a way that is really true to who I am and who I want to be. And so I need to fix it. Uh, you know, health scares and just bad relationships turn, turn bad. And so that, I mean, hopefully other people are, are kind of picking up on some of these things before they get to bad health or bad relationships. But those, those were wake up calls for me. And as soon as I did that, I realized I gotta, I gotta turn this around and I gotta schedule soccer around things that I wanted to do and things that made me happy versus, uh, just letting soccer practice and planning practices and recruiting bleed into everything else because I was allowing that to happen and it, it wasn't wasn't good wasn't pretty <laughs> and how does busy coach work to help a- to help coaches well so most coaches I would say are um, they uh, most coaches use their to-do list as their or use their email as their to-do list and a lot are very distracted a lot have uh, to-do lists that are hundreds and hundreds of items long and when it, it really is an all-consuming profession I know a lot of young kids they're like what do you do all day like aren't you just at practice no there's so many things that coaches have to do and so I help coaches uh, get clear on their vision and their goals that's first usually because that will help uh, coaches really significantly reduce how many things are on their to-do list because not everything is going to help lead to their goals a lot of it is unnecessary stuff and so get clear on that and then I think most coaches work off the top of their head right so they keep everything in their head and it's hard to delegate it's hard to know what to fix if everything's in your head so I I, I usually always start with like a master to-do list of everything that a coach has to do throughout the course of the season and then that becomes the foundation of the planning because it's kind of you start with big picture planning and then you go to the month and then you go to the week and then you go to the day and it's just uh, helping coaches show up with more intention and be more in control of what they're doing day by day instead of letting randomness and inconsistency and distractions or other people sending you email uh, dictate and deciding what you're doing. So it's uh, that's a really long answer to your short question, but it's uh, trying to just help coaches get more control over their day. I know on your website you talk a little bit about your whys. Why do the whys for something really help you achieve your goal? Because uh, the whys help you stay focused on what is really important to you. I think the whys are key to helping you maintain motivation when things get hard. I think the whys help you, uh, it, it, they're kind of a decision filter, right? Is, you know, do I continue to keep doing this uh, or do I not continue to keep doing this? And so it's, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, ultimately it's a motivation thing is you got to keep the main thing, the main thing, right? And if you're not sure as to why you're doing something, um, you can drift and go off in a thousand different directions. So it's kind of, it's kind of like being on that hamster wheel, right? If you're not clear on where you're going, you know, you're just going to work, work, work and not really get anywhere so the whys help help keep you focused and uh, eliminate a lot of unnecessary things I know through the past few months I've kind of lost my why for the podcast and I think I'm just starting to get it back but Mm -hmm. what can someone do to really find it again uh well be clear on who are you helping right because that uh, sometimes can really help is you know what is uh, I mean for anything right is what is the purpose for why I'm going to be doing this thing and a lot of it can be you know who am I helping Um, it could be who who is uh, I don't want to say who is who am I hurting right if I don't do this podcast but it's more you know helping versus hurting like who would be affected if they didn't hear what I was trying to do, right? You know, ultimately, what are you, what are you hoping these skills that you're developing through the podcast, what are these, like, long-term, how is that going to help, like, your bigger picture? Is this something that is a stepping stone, right, to something bigger that you have, like, uh, as a vision for yourself, possibly? Um so, I mean, stuff like that, I would say, is just keep reconnecting with those types of things. And, you know, and even like, how does it affect your family, right? Um, you know, I mean, all those are things, I think, there are, are things to keep checking in on to, to keep connecting with your why. 
Should we encourage players to find their why or maybe even just find a goal that they want to achieve? I think, uh, I mean, being, how old are you? 16. Yeah. So as a 16 year old, it might, uh, I mean, all of that is, I mean, I think anything you can do to give yourself direction, but I think like with a goal, a goal, the difference between a, like a why, why is your purpose, right? Whereas a goal is going to be more something that can, that will keep you accountable to your actions, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think definitely setting goals as far as striving to do more things and push you beyond your comfort level. But I even think with goals with uh, younger kids, you should have good goals, you should have better goals, and you should have best goals, different things to stretch your thinking and stretch your creativity for how you could actually approach things. Um, uh, Because ultimately all of it, right, is getting you out of your comfort zone to see and explore things because I think I think you develop your purpose more the more you challenge yourself to try to achieve new things Uh, I think as you try new things that's where more and more your purpose and your why will really kind of come out as to what you're meant to do I mean I think when I was your age I tried a thousand different things because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and each thing that I tried uh, you know you're you're gonna see pretty quick do you love it do you hate it, <laughs> right? And and each thing that you're able to figure out, you love or hate, you know, you're eliminating your crossing off options, which will help you get, you know, a step closer to where ultimately you want to go, I think. I think sometimes there may be that fear factor with trying new things. How can we encourage maybe just young athletes to go out and try a new sport or a new activity? Yeah, no, I think, um, and that's a great question, is I think it is first... I think you got to connect them with the the fun part of it, right? Because I think, like anything, right? As adults, a lot of adults don't want to get into doing exercise because they see it as not being fun, right? But if you can find something that will make it fun for them, right? Whether it is being around other kids or being around, just trying, you know, something different. Um, You know, but a lot of it is going to be the kids and the connection. Like my son, my son is 11. And we, when we moved to Youngstown, he didn't really know anybody. And so that was some, something that we encouraged him to do was let's get out and let's try a couple different sports. You might like it, you might not, but let's, you know, just get Get out just to meet other kids who, you know, because, yeah, you know, I mean, he noticed pretty quickly that a lot of the kids that he was going to school with all were friends with each other. Well, they're probably all friends with each other because they all, you know, play sports together. And so I'm like, you know, one, it's getting you out of the house and getting some exercise, but mostly it's let's have fun and, and start meeting other kids. So I, I think you focus on the fun part of it and what's in it for them and what they could get out of meeting new people and trying different things um, is how I would uh, would uh, would try to get kids to, or how I've tried to get my kids to, to get out and do different sports that they're not, they haven't ever shown real interest in. What can we do to find the fun in a training session? <laughs> find the fun in a training session is, I think, uh, I think a lot of that, I think too many kids rely on their coaches to bring the fun in the training session. I think if a kid, I think kids need to take more responsibility in that. And, and, but, you know, that's connecting with what makes it fun for me, right? Is it the people that are fun? Is it the, like for me, I think there's, and I always would say this to teams, I think there's stupid fun, right? Where you're just goofing around and laughing and joking and whatever. But there's also the fun of beating you know, beating teams by a lot, right? And crushing them and dominating them. That to me was more fun. And so I think it's, you know, identifying the couple different types of fun and then really connecting them with, look, you know, the, the appropriate time in a play in place for like stupid fun, right? Versus getting there and having fun, putting in their best effort and, you know, working hard to, uh, to dominate the drill or dominate the whatever. So I think it's right. Getting kids clear on what fun is for them. And then, teaching them the appropriate moments to bring that out. How have your past experiences really helped you to help other coaches with recruiting? 
Uh, past, I mean, most of it is uh, mistakes that I've made, right? But a lot of it um, that I'm doing now is, I mean, I get to talk to a lot of coaches every single day. I mean, even this morning, I've already talked to a good half a dozen to a dozen coaches about their recruiting. And so it's, I mean, most of it is just getting getting face-to-face with them and asking a lot of questions, seeing where their troubles are like even you know right I was that's where I was just talking to when you guys walked up is where where are the problems and then because I've been doing this for so long there really isn't a whole lot uh, that I haven't experienced or tried or tested or but or now I mean I get to I get to talk to some of the best coaches in the country and I get to hear what's working and not working and then it's just through the conversations that I'm having you know I try to share as much as I can I always uh, like I'm presenting tomorrow and I uh one of my first slides is, you know, somebody drinking water out of a fire hose is that's pretty much what I do to a lot of coaches is just try to get, you know, cause you never know what, what one thing is going to really connect and hit home with them. So just try to get, ask a lot of good questions and then try to give them relevant experiences that I've had. Did you ever expect that you would use this much trial and error throughout your learning process? Uh, probably not. Uh, I mean, right. You always want to pick it up immediately the first time but but I think uh, as I've gotten older I've learned to really appreciate the trial and error process uh, and if anything it's try to f- like I don't want to say like fail faster right because the faster I'm out taking action and lo- you know and then and, and this is something I'm going to talk about tomorrow in my presentation is uh, plan it do it uh, review it and then learn and make improvements from it right and I think if I had had that mentality sooner I would be much further ahead than I am right now because I think too many people are, are afraid to get out and try different things for fear of failure right and when they because when they fail it's like oh I made a mistake no let's plan it do it right and then learn from it right and make improvements because I think uh, athletes and coaches that have that sort of mentality are going to move much faster because everybody's going to fail at everything. You're never going to be perfect. But if you can move on from that and learn from it, right, that's, uh, those, those are the coaches that get ahead much, much faster. Do you think we could teach or possibly help ourselves grow within that man- mentality of learning from failure? Oh, no, absolutely. And, I mean, that's the only way you're going to learn, right, is, uh, I mean, because I don't know too many people that actually learn from, I mean, what do you learn from winning all the time, right? Is And that's where I, I'd like to, t- I mean, you certainly learn some things from winning, but there are, uh, that's where I, I tell coaches to embrace problems, right? Because problems are there to help you identify what can get fixed, right? Where like even in the recruiting process, a lot of coaches will keep recruiting kids. They'll keep them on their board and won't, you know, try to get a yes or a no, or won't try to, uh, they, they just kind of keep stringing things along, hoping they're going to get the yes, but fearing the no, where I'm like, let's get the no, let's get the no right away and let's move on quicker. And it, so I, yes, I think embracing failure is, uh, will, will help coaches make progress much, much faster. When you're recruiting, how can you tell that an athlete has learned from their failure? Uh, I mean, I, I suppose with recruiting, I mean, most recruiting processes are three months, six months, a year, year and a half, right? And so I would imagine over repeated conversations and repeated watching the athlete, um, or even, you know, I mean, with soccer, you don't really have like a track and field or a swimming. You don't have the times to, you know, to, uh, to judge based off of, you don't have those objective measures, right? It's more of a subject, subjective watching them over the course of time. But, you know, I think you, you just have to keep watching and observing and seeing if they're, you know, making the same mistakes over and over again, you know, watching their body language. Is it improving or getting worse, right, as failures happen? Um, but, yeah, it's just over a repeated time or asking really good questions. But I think that's the only way you can really see it because it's not going to be like a one-time thing. Oh, yeah, you know, or I don't think there's one good question you can ask somebody to see if they're, you know, learning from failures. I think it's over repeated, repeated months and months of watching them play or talking to them, hearing how they're reacting to things. I think that's how, yeah, how to do it. Earlier you mentioned a little bit about your mission with Busy Coach. How have you felt yourself improve and your mindset improve? 
Well, I've improved because I've challenged myself to really dive deep on the information. To uh, So I have a lot of relevant information to be able to share with coaches. So I've certainly improved that way. And I even, uh, I was telling somebody earlier, I wish... If I would have known now what I know about recruiting and being more productive coach when I was coaching, uh, I mean, I still certainly could be coaching if I wanted to, but uh, I I probably would have made less mistakes or been able to move on from my mistakes much faster faster knowing what I know now. But it's, uh, uh, no, I mean, just through Busy Coach, it's... uh, I mean, I've, I've challenged myself to do online courses. I've challenged myself to get on video. I've challenged myself to start a podcast myself, right? I mean, I've challenged myself to do all these things that had I just been in coaching, I never probably would have gotten into doing much of that stuff. So so there's there's been, I mean, I, I'm probably more out of my comfort zone than in my comfort zone with most of the stuff that I do with Busy Coach because I just, I'm, I've been a coach, right? Is I don't didn't have the business background, didn't have a video or podcasting or any of that kind of background. And so all of it's new for me. So I'm, I'm learning as I go too, but I mean, it's challenging and it's, uh, it's certainly, it's, it's put me out in front of thousands and thousands of coaches every single year. And it's, uh, that, that kind of keeps fueling my, uh, my motivation to keep going on it. Even there's some days where it's hard. There are some days where I'm like, in tears because I'm like I don't get how to do this or this isn't working but but then I come to conventions or I talk to coach or I get an email like oh my gosh like I talked to a basketball coach this morning and he goes I don't know if you knew but I was in the in the in the I was I was at the conference you spoke at like five years ago in Boston and I took immediately some of the things you talked about and oh my gosh and he like started listing off the ways that it's helped and I'm like that's why. That's why I'm trying to push through the hard stuff of not knowing how to do some of the stuff I'm doing just to, to keep helping, helping coaches. Because a lot of what you do, right, you, you're you working hard, working hard, and you don't necessarily see the, the benefits or the, you know, the improvement or whatever. And I'm a big believer in the uh, compound effect, where if you haven't read that book, that's a he- oh, I love that book, but the habits, the choices, the behaviors, right? The decisions that you're making every single day, whether you realize it or not, like eating French fries, right? Eating French fries today isn't going to give you a heart attack, right? Mm -hmm. But repeated, you know, or whatever decision, right, that you might be making, like smoking cigarettes, right? You're not going to die of lung cancer after your first cigarette, but over repeated exposures, right, years after year, that's when, like, right, either you're going to go up, you're going to go down based on these decisions that you've made. And that's where I think with coaching, it's a lot of the same, a lot of the same. You don't, you're doing positive things, but you don't see the, the results from it yet, but you just got to keep mm-hmm. with it and keep those repeated, consistent actions over the long haul. That's when people either go up, right? Those overnight successes yeah. that you hear, right? It's not overnight. They just repeatedly over years and years and months and months uh, did the right things and made the right choices. And that's like all of a sudden it mm-hmm. just kind of took off. Yeah. And that's making a lot of sense as to maybe I found, lost my why mm-hmm. as I wasn't really seeing an outcome but Mm -hmm. kind of when I'm here I realize why I'm doing it because I'm around everyone and I'm seeing the reward of Mm -hmm. everyone coming and acknowledging me yep 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 and I mean what you probably don't realize is that these messages that you're putting out is affecting people that you don't even know Mm -hmm. right that you don't know everybody who's listening to this right and one key thing might totally change the course of somebody's you know just their decisions or their outlook or their attitude or their their why all of a sudden they might connect with that and so that's where things like this are they're rewarding eventually but you just don't see that right away and so that's where a lot of people quit before you really see like how it might take off um but that's where it's in talking to your audience, you know, and just seeing what they're checking in on. Or like you said, is, you know, being around the people who are listening to it and hearing how it's affecting them is, uh, it's, it's super helpful. If you know of someone who has a really good thing going, but they're starting to quit because they aren't seeing progress, how should we help them? Uh, just a lot of encouragement, right, is, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, just like we were talking about is connecting them to why they started it to begin with because there was a reason they started yeah. it to begin with right and and sometimes and this is I have a lot of coaches do this is I think coaches should connect to their their vision connect to their why connect to their purpose every single 
morning. You know, I think too many coaches drift and they get, you know, things get going so fast before they know it, they're completely going in the wrong direction because they're spending more time in the day looking at their phone than they're looking at their goals. You know, and the phone is nothing but a bunch of distractions you know versus starting the day with why am I not why am I doing this but why why am I here who am I helping with this right so even before you do your podcast right who am I hoping to reach with this what am I trying what is the outcome that I want with this even just checking in with that for 30 seconds uh you know so encouraging people to keep keep connecting to why they started it to begin with you know, and, and, and what they're hoping to get from it, right? So what is the bridge, right, that they need to, where are they now, why did they start it, and where, where are they going with it? Um, and just keep encouraging action towards things, because you never know. You never know what might be said or the one thing that might just get everything yeah. to take off. You never know. But you're never going to know if you stop, right? you got to keep. got to keep doing it. Before each podcast, I like to do a decent amount of research, but sometimes I also find that to be overwhelming. And I know mul- people with multiple different tasks have trouble organizing. Yep. What can we really do to organize that and stay on top of things? Uh, I would create a list of things that, so a checklist, right? What, what is your checklist of things that you absolutely need to know? I would give yourself a time limit for how long you're able to do research before each one because you could quickly get the, go down the rabbit hole of you know hours and hours and hours and I mean if you need hours and hours and you want to keep doing the podcast I would uh, change the frequency at which your podcasts are going out mm-hmm. but if you are trying to get a bunch of people talking to you all at one time uh, I would shorten the amount of time you give yourself to do the uh, the research because you only have so much time in a day yeah. to do things and I mean again a problem you being overwhelmed by doing the research it, there's there's got to be a better way right mm-hmm. to do it and so I think the difference between good and great is an extra week of research right so yeah. could you go I mean lots of people are doing podcasts right so and and like one thing I find is um, there's a lot of people who produce a lot of podcasts that will put they do all the recordings in the same day right Mm -hmm. they only give themselves or they 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 hire somebody else to do the research right what what are the key things you need to know they have somebody else do that or they give themselves a time limit to do it and they try to like do all the research on all the podcasts they have for the month in the same day Right? Mm-hmm. Give yourself a time limit to do it. Try to set up all the, the recordings on the same day, right? So you could, if you give yourself an hour to do, say you're doing four, four podcasts, you give yourself an hour, uh, and then it takes you a couple hours to do the actual podcast. Uh, you do it all in the same day, boom, done for the rest of the month, mm-hmm. right? And now you're letting your brain recharge, recharge your batteries, or you're doing research, figuring out how other people are, are you know, putting out a lot of podcasts without yeah. burning themselves out on it. So stuff like that. Did you ever go through a period of time where you did feel burned out? Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was uh, when I first had kids, when I was at South Dakota, that was hard. It was really hard. Um, but I wasn't. My, I was not blessed with kids that slept very well, so I wasn't sleeping. And I had, my to do list was a million things long, and I wasn't prioritizing. Basically, everything that I told you to do, I was not doing. And that's because I got to the point of burnout. That's where Busy Coach was created. It wasn't my intention to start a company from it, <laughs> but again, I I, I had I, I kind of had a choice to make. Was I going to quit? coaching or was I going to find a better way right and so I just went out and started studying what other people were doing in the business world because there's not really a whole lot written for for coaches uh, on managing their time and energy and all that kind of stuff so I just figured out what other people were doing and one by one started applying some certain things here there and that led to the next thing and I just started layering things on and before I knew it I'm like it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm done. Like, mm-hmm. what else do I have left to do, right? But I mean, there was a lot that had to get eliminated, and there were a lot of different choices to be made, which are uncomfortable. But once I got past that, and I wasn't good at doing a lot of it to begin with, mm-hmm. but once I got into it and started doing it more and more and figured out what worked for me and didn't work for me, it, it became easier. If a coach is experiencing burnout and they go to Busy Coach, what should they expect? Uh, what, uh, 
I mean, a lot of it is just kind of talking through what got them to that point to begin with. Because um, usually it is. They're, uh, a lot of it is either they're not exercising, they're overwhelmed by the amount of tasks, they're not sleeping, they're not eating right. So a lot of it is just kind of doing a, a deep dive as to what's got them. To, or it could be a person, right, that's burning them out or, uh, you know, a series of people. Because I know that certainly happened with me at South Dakota. Is there, was, there was a few that I was dealing with that weren't pleasant to deal with. But it's, um, so it's kind of getting to the root of the problem. What's causing the problem? Because I think everybody, everybody has a way of doing things. It's a system, right? It's a process for doing things. And that process is set up perfectly for the results they're getting, right? So if they're burnt out, their process is leading them to burnout. And so we got to change something in their process in order to, you know, and so we got to break that stuff down. Like I, I like saying, um, the things I do with Busy Coach is it's kind of like the uh, like the race cars, the Formula One race car, right? I don't know much about race car driving, but I know that sucker goes really fast, right? That car did not start out as a high performance machine. It started off as a bunch of individual parts, right? And so with coaches, I try to break things down into individual pieces and, and break it down. What's working? What's not working? What is our current system? What's working? What's not working? What can we optimize? What do we need to take out? What do we need to do more of? What do we need to do less of? What do we need to start doing? What do we need to stop doing? Uh, and then put the pieces back together, right? So it's uh, plan it, do it, review it, and then improve it is, is basically the, uh, a process that I take coaches through with a lot of things. Can coaches take some of these ideas and also help their players manage their time and just ability to do things? Oh, no, for sure. Because, I mean, I think, I mean, time management is time management, right? And so a lot of it is, I think with coaches, a lot of it is what to eliminate. Because, right, you, you already have a really full day. So you can't add more to what you're already doing. A lot of it, you probably got to take things away. And so it's coming up with what, what you know, again, what, what, where are the problems with the system, right? What, what are the issues and what are the results you're getting? Okay. What are the individual pieces? What is your current way of doing things? And then, yeah, what do we add? What do we take away? What do we start? What do we stop? And that usually helps. helps. Uh, so whether it's a student athlete or a, an athlete or a parent or whoever, right, is... I think it applies to everything. I know you've talked a little bit about your connections today. How important is an event like we're at right now to help you grow your business, but also your personal connections? Oh, no, for sure. I mean, I, th I, I certainly know that uh, the, the speed at which most coaches rise up in the ranks of this profession is uh, who you know. I mean, there's, there's over my 23 years, we certainly have gotten jobs at certain places because of who I knew and the connections that I had. So uh, networking and talking, I mean, I, I would say even some of the jobs that I landed were from doing my, my, uh, my coaching licenses. I met my husband at one of the, the coaching courses, uh, but I mean, I, I have lifelong friends that I have met at some of these conventions, and that's what, it's hard to see who people are, right, with the masks on, but, uh, but uh, there's a lot of people that I've seen that I haven't seen for years, and, and soccer is such a small uh, even though there's a lot of coaches, it's still a small world, and uh, it's you know making making as many connections as you can. One makes it more fun to go out to these places, uh, but two, right? You never know who might be needing help or who might you know be able to help you move along uh, in certain things. So. I would, and, and that was actually a habit that I started to develop was a workday startup routine was uh, who is one person I can connect to that, you know, will uh, help with recruiting or a coach that I'm looking to build a rapport with, but just little, little connections all throughout, you know, again, that compound effect, like I didn't see the impact right away, but month after month after month, all of a sudden, you know, club coaches that weren't even talking to me at first all of a sudden they're like you know what Mandy I got somebody for you you know because I remember you reached out and you know we had a conversation I got somebody you know so it uh again it, it's something that you might not see the effect from right away but it's uh it, it's yeah. huge I have one final question which I ask each guest what do you hope people remember about your impact to soccer and the world Ooh, uh what do I hope um 
I want people to know that and feel that with the advice that I gave or the push that I that I gave or how I challenged them with certain things that ultimately I uh, I made the game easier for them right because it is it's you know with a lot of athletes coaches get on your case about a lot of things but it's because we know you got more in you or that there's an easier way to do it than how you're doing it uh, and so I mean I would say with all the coaches I, I, I've been told many times that I am the meanest nice person that people know because it's I'm, I'm not gonna I don't know I just try to push push and challenge to get kids out of their comfort zone or even the coaches that I work with out of their comfort zone do things they're not used to doing but I know if they can get past that they're gonna be better off and bigger and better right on the other side and be able to accomplish more than they ever thought they were so uh, but I'll so I, I, so that's that's what I would say is what I hope thank you so much for joining me today yeah no thanks for having me those are a lot of great questions Burnout is 100% something I have been dealing with lately, and it has been a challenge, but I never really realized what it was and why I was struggling so much. So talking to Mandy today was really beneficial for me because it helped me understand my feelings and recognize that it was burnout that was happening. Now that I know what I have been experiencing, I feel like I can find techniques and move forward and hopefully become a better version of myself. Many people experience burnout like that, and it's important to know you're not alone and you can get through it. I'm excited to see what the future holds. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and until next time, remember to keep the game beautiful.